and um, hello everybody and thank you so much the Vitiligo Society for having me for this year's talk on Vitiligo. Um, being here isn't just being here with any organisation, the Vitiligo Society holds a really strong part in my heart, a really strong place in my heart because age 21 I was diagnosed with this skin condition which really took over my life. Um, just to put things into perspective, um, I was in my third year of university and I was really enjoying life, as you do when you're 21, you know. Um, I had the privilege of living abroad, um, I was studying languages, I was living in Spain and I, did, I had a fantastic year abroad in the south of Spain, enjoying the culture, enjoying the language, enjoying the people. And, um, you know, it was very hot out there. Um, and I have to be honest, I didn't really protect my skin much. So, you know, I was quite young, quite naive to a certain extent. And when I came back from um, Spain, uh, actually, when I was there, I noticed a white spot. It was very faded, a tiny spot that was on the, on the left of my arm. And I thought, so oh, it's just something to do with my, you know, suntan or something like that that just affected my skin. Didn't really think anything of it. And then I flew back to London two weeks later and my tan faded faded and faded and underneath that tan there was a slightly bigger spot and I knew that this was not normal I just felt it you know when you just kind of look at your body and you know something doesn't feel quite right so mum being a nurse said right let's get you down to the GP she'd never seen anything like that in her nursing career she, she just didn't, didn't know what it was hadn't seen any patients with it didn't have anything like this in my family she said, how about we go back down to the GP and let's see what they say. And luckily at that time in, uh, in 1999, I didn't think GPs would be, you know, very knowledgeable about vitiligo. But I had a GP who told me straight away, it's vitiligo and these are your two options. And she was very blunt. She said, option number one, you learn to live with this. It could spread. Option number two, have some treatment down in King's College. Anyway, you know. I just thought this is all going to be fixed and my life's all going to be fine, you know, as you do when you're 21, you know, just you'll get that sorted out and everything will be absolutely fine. And on I go to get to my finals. But life wasn't quite like that, unfortunately, ended up um, having to take a year out of uni. The vitiligo spread. It carried on spreading. I became depressed um, and I went down a really, really dark road. Um, and just this, you know, just from our, you know, this morning after Linda was talking about, you know, isolation and sort of removing yourself from people, that's exactly what I did because I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what was happening to my body. I felt no one understood what I was going through. And if no one understands what you're going through, why are you going to share something like that with them? Why? I mean, they don't, they're not going to understand what this white patch is that's spreading. No one else has it. So I dealt with it on my own which is the worst thing I could have ever done looking back. I dealt with it on my own thinking, there's me, I can handle this. Um, put my parents through quite a lot of stress. Um, kept myself in my bedroom, cried, didn't eat, had very sort of strong suicidal thoughts. Um, it was very bleak, very, very bleak. So during the time that I took out of university, I then started to work on myself a little bit. Just a different, you know, just some different things along that route, um, but just nothing seemed to work. And it was a really, really difficult journey because as I saw a patch on the left arm, I'd see a patch on the right arm. And it was fine covering my body because, you know, I could go to family functions and coming from a South Asian background, I felt even more pressure because coming from a South Asian background, there is so much prejudice and there's a lot of stigma and a lot of taboo on how you look you know, what your family's like, essentially. And I felt really, really ugly, really ugly. So I used to hide my skin and I hid it with camouflage makeup. And I learned how to do this really tactfully. And I thought I did it really well. I thought I hid my vitiligo with great disguise. I found out just, you know, when I started um, showing my skin, I didn't hide it so well, but I thought I hid it really well. I'd spend hours covering my skin and use, you know, fixing spray and all sorts to try and get the, you know, the color right. Um, and I lived like that for about 20 years. 
um, you know, I, I I landed myself after, you know, I mean, I did graduate and I worked in corporate banking for about a year and a half. That was incredibly difficult because people are so well dressed in the city. You're jumping on trains, as Natalie said, you know, it's not comfortable jumping on a train when it's really, really hot. You want to get your clothes off. You want to get your cardigan off. You want to wear a dress. And I would be covered in a suit, making sure my hands were covered to my nails and my feet were covered by long trousers. It was just awful. Um, and I look back at that and um, I look back and I, I, I kind of think to myself, how did I manage that? How did I manage to cover it? I covered it from neighbours. I covered up my vitiligo from my work at that. I left graduate banking and became a teacher. I covered up vitiligo from my school, from my head, from my colleagues, from my students, from my students in my classes that I was te teaching. I covered it up from close family. I covered it up from cousins and I covered it up from the whole world. And, you know, when I, I, I kind of think of that now and I'm just like, what what did I do to myself? But that was my my survival. And many of you watching this will realize that sometimes you do that because you want to survive. That's your way of of managing it, because if you hide it, you can deal with it. But you think you're dealing with it. And actually, you're just kind of kind of containing it within yourself as opposed to kind of really getting to the core of understanding what's going on and I think that's really what happened to me so as I as I contained it and I hid my vitiligo I suppressed it and I suppressed myself and when you suppress yourself you know you cause yourself even more anxiety you cause yourself more stress you cause yourself so much pain um, the only person that you're really hurting is yourself. So for those of you out there that are at that phase of where I was, I really want you to sort of think about, about the pain you're causing on yourself and that you really don't deserve that. You really don't. And there have to be ways that you can get through it. And I will talk about that um, towards the end of my, my talk, my presentation this evening. It's really hard when you're on a journey uh, going through something where you don't feel that anyone else understands, hence why the Vitiligo Society was my first point of contact. And I met Gadeep, who was on this call here. She was my first friend who I'd met with Vitiligo. And when I met her in person, uh, which took about uh, about nine months to, to meet her in person, because I was so afraid of meeting someone else with Vitiligo, it felt like a huge weight off my shoulders. And I've met so many people recently who just can't meet other people who can't bring themselves to forums, to discussions because they just haven't come to terms with it. And, and that's absolutely fine. But I do know that just talking to people and being able to release those thoughts is so therapeutic and so helpful and really healing. And that was my first point of healing, being able to talk and communicate with one friend at the Vitiligo Society and one friend outside of the Vitiligo Society who I'd made. And I really urge those of you out there who are sort of struggling on your own to find someone that you can reach out to and talk to because it really does help you process what you're feeling and allow yourself to be heard and allow yourself to know that there is someone out there who's listening and who does understand what you're going through. Following on from the support of the Vitiligo Society, my Vitiligo did carry on spreading. I did go through a variety of different, you know, forms of treatment, which I did try, but I did end up getting pregnant in 2010 with my daughter. So I had got married and I had met someone who had met me before my vitiligo and we we got married. He stood by me. We got married um, and we had um, children. We had my my daughter. And I think that for me was a real turning point because when I fell pregnant, you know, I didn't really have those emotions and I didn't have that time to be thinking about myself in the way that I was before, because I was so exhausted, I was so tired, I had to kind of put all that energy into my baby. And in a way, that's a good thing, because I was forced to have to think about something else. Um, and it allowed me to you know not all just be about me, myself and I, which my vitiligo journey had been every new patch, every new spot, what I had seen, what I hadn't seen, you know, where it was spreading, where it was going, what was happening, what I was eating, what I was drinking. Every part of my life was just analysed uh, by myself. Uh, my family got involved as well, you know, looking at what I should eat, maybe what I shouldn't eat. We, you know, did talk to different professionals and try to look at those sort of things as well. Every part of my life was analysed and it was controlled. So 
you know, it's very, very difficult when you are going through that. You know, your vitiligo is spreading like wildfire. You're trying to control it, but you don't have that control. And it's just really, really tough. But I couldn't do anything about it. I mean, I realized when I had my daughter, I had to focus on her and I wanted to take her to baby classes and I want I wanted to get in a swimming pool. I wanted to go on holiday and not be the family that was, you know, coming out at seven o'clock in the evening to use the beach or use a swimming pool because everyone else had gone indoors because I was so ashamed that I would force my family at that point to come out at seven o'clock when everyone was inside for dinner because that's how embarrassed I was that I would cover up my skin even when I just dip into the beach and it is vitiligo does make you feel like that it makes you feel worthless it makes you feel ugly it makes you feel like you're someone who is a monster that's how I felt when I had it but times have changed we've moved on so much and I would say that in 20 years so much has happened you know, in the media, um, everything we see and we hear and we look at, people, visual differences, we're seeing so much more of that, that, you know, this is becoming normal. Our differences are becoming normalised. And just looking different does not mean that we have to stand out being in a negative way. We stand out in a positive way. And I feel that now with so much exposure and so many people talking about, you know, not just vitiligo and all different types of skin conditions and visual differences, that we are part of a movement. And, you know, we, we need to be proud of that movement. So where am I today? I'm a mum of two children. I'm a teacher. Um, I run my Positively Diverse. And life has been very, very difficult. You know, it was only until 2016 that my you know, that I changed my mindset. And that mindset didn't happen overnight. It happened in, in very small steps. Small steps, I'm going to give you a couple of examples, would look like getting in a swimming pool for baby swim classes with my daughter, which was the most antagonizing, stressful situation ever, knowing there were going to be other mums in that pool who I thought would be staring at me, but they weren't. They were just focused on their babies turning up at the school gate, which I have talked about quite openly on my social media, when I turned up at the school gate without vitiligo, you know, and my son, a friend of his, uh, said to him, uh, said to my son, oh, what's that on your mum's face really loudly during COVID when we had to line up outside the school? Children couldn't walk in. You had to line up outside the school before your children could be allowed inside. And I remember this child said so loudly, what's that on your mum's hand? And um, I took it into my own hands to to sort of say to the child, oh, you know, let me just tell you what this is. It's vitiligo. And my son sort of just looked at me, what you know, worried about how I'd handle it. I handled it in a really confident way. And because I was confident, he felt this sense of that's my mum. It's only a skin condition. You know, it's nothing wrong with her. She's she's my mum and she looks, you know, she's she might have white and brown skin. She's here and she's just the same as everyone else. It's about instilling that confidence in our children so that they can then share that with their peers. And that's a lot of the work that I've been doing is not just within within sort of working with students at school, but delivering that message through my children so they can share that to their peers and to their parents who I know have questions when they see me outside that school gate with patches on my face. So I think the real message here that I want to share is education and being a teacher myself and having many years of, of experience working in a high school and in a primary school and now working with special needs children is that we all have to give the ch our children an opportunity to allow them to understand what vitiligo is, for them to process it and then for them to share that knowledge as well. And most of the time that children do understand what vitiligo is, they're not really that bothered. They just want to know what it is. And that's it. And I think that's the same approach, really, that we need to use for adults as well. That glare, that stare, you know, what people might be doing when you kind of catch them looking at you uh, might not just be because of your skin. It might be because as both, you know, Nasi and, and um, Linda said this morning, at this before, that it could be because of, you know, what you're wearing. And quite often, because we're so self-absorbed in our skin, we're so focused on like our patch and where it's spreading and where it's going and how it looks and where it is. And we often forget, you know, that actually people aren't really bothered about, you know, our, our skin. They might be looking at other things. And quite often these days, most people are self-absorbed in their phone, 
looking at their phones in the gym, self-absorbed at themselves in the gym. And that's really, I mean, sadly, how society has gone. People are really focused on themselves. They're not really worried about what's that spot on her face. Whereas I would say about 20 years ago, you know, perhaps that was the case, but I think things have progressed so rapidly things have moved forward so much. And I want that to just be a sort of a sense of relief to those of you out there who are thinking, you know what, it's, it is. I mean, at that time, you do feel that. You feel that everyone is focused on your skin. My skin is now spreading. I'm now, I would say, about 90% white. And um, I have learned to accept how it is through um, through my mindset, through, through doing a variety of different forms of self um support self-help um you know I talk a lot to friends and family I am I liaise a lot with the Sligo society um I love to share content on social media sharing about my experiences with vitiligo um, and I think those really support people those things really support people um and like I said you know it's not it's not been an overnight journey for me it's it's happened over many many years and from my 20s to my 30s I wasted all of those years worrying about my skin and covering up from my 30s to the to my 40s becoming a mum and going through those transitional changes I wasted many many years worrying about what other people were thinking about me I'm not going to spend my life from my 40s to 50s now you know wasting another second on people's perceptions and people's thoughts Um, and I'd really like you to think about that as well you know, your life is so precious and how you live your life is by doing the things that make you happy. If you want to cover up your skin, you know, cover it up. I did. And at that time, I thought that that's what made me fit in. That's what made me a part of everyone else. But actually, looking back at that now, this is what makes me feel like I fit in. This is me with my vitiligo skin. And I wouldn't change that for the world. I think mindset's a really important thing. You know, I mean, a lot of people say it's important to work on the mindset, but what do we mean by mindset? There are so many different forms of being able to work on yourself from meditation to walking. Some people work, use the gym. Some people have therapy. Some people reach out for professional support. And the Vitiligo Society is absolutely amazing at providing that. Coaching, having one-on-one coaching, body confidence coaching as well. There's so many coaches out there who I know work with people to support them feeling better and feeling more confident. Um, but pigeon steps for me have always been, you know, that's been my my way of getting up that mountain. And I always describe my journey as a journey of getting up Mount, Mount Everest. And I wouldn't actually say I'm at the peak of Mount Everest, um, even though I am very confident in the skin that I am, I'm in, I am in. It's been a really tough journey climbing up that mountain. I'll get to to a point of the mountain where sometimes I might regress a little bit and I'll wake up one day and say, you know, I really don't feel great about the way I look. And that's absolutely normal to feel like that. I don't want to say that every day I wake up and I'm, I'm absolutely happy. I mean, I've learned to accept how I am. Sometimes I, you know, wake up and I'll say, you know, I'm having a challenging day today, but how do you get yourself out of that? How do you make yourself feel better? And the types of strategies that I use to make myself feel better are, you know, number one, I love walking. I love walking. That's, you know, one of the things that I love to do with my dog twice a day. If I fit it in before work, after work, you know, that really makes me feel so grounded. I can just let and let off and release all those thoughts that I'm feeling. So it's so important to find what is that therapy that works for you and you don't necessarily have to be going and paying people money to support you with therapy because it can be quite expensive but what's that one thing that makes you feel where you can just release those thoughts because it's releasing those thoughts that's so important rather than have it fester inside of you and I find that when vitiligo does fester inside you that's when things start you know exacerbating they start getting worse your vitiligo might flare up And that's what we don't want to happen. We want to know how you're going to contain it, how you can look after and manage that stress and deal with that. You know, what are those tools that support you to become, you know, relaxed and be able to manage your vitiligo? So that's something else I'd like you to think about this evening as well. It's really important for me as a mum to to, to know that my children, because we were talking earlier on about 
confidence and a lot's come up in the feed about how we support our children, how we support our children. I've done a lot of work in schools about body positivity, raising confidence with young people, particularly girls at secondary level. And I think it's really important those parents out there who are asking about where do you start, where do you go? please, can I give you one bit of advice? Reach out to the pastoral team at your school. There's a pastoral team in every single secondary school. The pastoral team is there to support your child with these matters. And it's really important that schools are aware about this because these are the issues that are coming up where children are being bullied very, very viciously through social media. So it's essential, absolutely essential that you do contact your school, you liaise with them, you talk to the pastoral and the head of year as well and have a conversation with them openly that this is what's going on. And it's a great way for the school to take control and start talking about these conversations within school, because that's something that I did at my school. And I think it really does break down those barriers and create that conversation for staff and students alike. Another thing as well is that had I have carried on, carried on covering up my skin, I would have created two children, my son and daughter, who would have looked at me and thought, we've got a mum who doesn't fit into society because she's got to cover up her skin. And that's not what I wanted to, you know, what I wanted my children to be. I wanted them to grow up as strong individuals, to be able to be confident in who they are. And it's really challenging for children at that age to go through secondary school as it is. But to have a skin condition on top of that, it must be really tough. So I think it's so important to deliver those positive affirmations to your child. That's something that was um, that we spoke about quite quite openly at my previous school as well. Positive affirmations to children work really, really well. So always telling your child about how amazing they're doing in a particular subject and why they're doing great. Not always just focusing on, you know, the aesthetics or how they look, but giving them the confidence in both academics and how they are as well. It's, it's, it's really, really important. Building that confidence within, within, within themselves at a young age is so important and crucial before they get to that GCSE stage where stress levels increase hugely. Um, I, you know, during COVID wanted to um, journal and I started journaling because I know that many people were talking about journaling during COVID. And I think at that time I had so many thoughts and ideas about what was going on in my head. You know, part of me was starting to accept vitiligo and accept my brown skin. But vitiligo had stripped me of my cultural identity and being a very, very um, strong South Asian Sikh girl from with strong, strong ethics behind me, I realized that, you know, my cultural identity was being stripped away as my vitiligo was uh, spreading. And that was really, really difficult. So I'm also on a mission to sort of break taboos within the South Asian culture. And I also do a lot of work working with the South Asian community to talk a lot about differences and acceptance and how we break those taboos as well because quite often it's just there's just a lack of understanding and people judge and quite often you'll get things like you know she she got that because you know her mom and dad were stressed or she got that because you know perhaps they you know they she was left alone or she was in a house file or this or that really bizarre thoughts we have to eliminate these um, ideas we have to you know speak the truth and we have to tell people about what vitiligo is and educate them uh, you know in a really in, in, in a really good way so that's where I launched my my book strong in the skin I'm in because I started writing I started journaling started talking about you know how I felt from a as a South Asian girl growing up with vitiligo and hiding it from my my community getting married on my wedding day with loads of makeup that no one could see a thing. I mean, that was just absolutely crazy. I look back at my wedding pictures and I wore a traditional red outfit and I did not have one spot of vitiligo showing because I made sure my makeup artist covered everything and I wore a long sleeve outfit right to the end of my hands here. So it was, you know, it was really, really tough wanting to hide from the world. Um, and I would say, you know, I don't know if I could have carried on. I don't know if I could have carried on living like that. And I don't know what kind of person I would be today if I carried on living like that. I think that um, it would have been an extremely, extremely difficult journey. And I'm thankful to the Vitiligo Society. I'm thankful to our, our Vitiligo community, to all the ambassadors and the people out there that are doing all of this work to raise awareness. And the key thing I just want to say today is you are not alone. 
You know, there are so many people out there to support and help you through your journey, through your child's journey or through whoever you know is going through this really difficult time. Reach out, reach out for support, um, because, you know, I think that's the first and fundamental thing that you can do when you have this skin condition and you, you just don't know what, where to turn to or who to turn to. Oh, that is absolutely fantastic. I always am blown away when you speak because you speak with such authenticity, honesty. You you cover so many different areas that are so relatable. And I just thank you so much for being here. Um, and you. seeing your growth as well from your uni days to getting married to running your great campaign now. And it's I'm, I'm really proud of you. Personally. I mean, I didn't, I didn't sort of, to be honest, I wanted it to be really natural and based on the comments, I wanted to go down a little bit of the teaching route. So I did sort of have to change up quite a bit of today's um, talk based on this, because I feel this is a topic that's really come up, children, school, um, and so forth. And I wanted to kind of direct it seeing as I have that experience there. So I hope that supports. Definitely. And a lot of people in the comments are also sharing their, their viewpoints, just saying that you're really inspirational. You've got an amazing energy um, and just, yeah, really thanking you for your, your time. Um, but just a quick question. So um, first, you tell us about Positively Diverse and your, your great book. Where can we find you? How can we follow you? And how can we see some of your amazing content? Of course. So... So this is a little memoir, and I haven't done much, if I'm very honest, to um, publicise it. It was a memoir written really to alleviate those thoughts, alleviate what was going through my life when I was struggling with vitiligo. Um, it wasn't meant to be Britain's big number one seller. It wasn't meant to be a big seller. It was just meant to be for me to release those thoughts and share it with people that wanted to be able to get some form of support in a similar way that I've experienced. Um, so this book is available on Amazon. Um, and it's also available as Amazon uh, on Amazon Kindle as well. It's about an, a one hour read. It's it's written in the most simple way. And it just I just talk about what life was like, how I dealt with it and the outcome of it. So it, it's pretty much a very simple read, a little memoir based on how tough it was to live with vitiligo and the outcome. Fantastic. And then lastly, what would be your top three tips for someone who is at the very beginning of their journey, maybe struggling to accept their skin? What three things would you tell them that you've learned on your journey? The three things I would say are really important from the beginning to the end, I say, would be communication. So always talking to those people that you that you know are there for you, that support you, that are right by your side, that you can lean on. If you feel that someone doesn't necessarily in your family or close circle of friends doesn't really get it or understand, reach out to someone who does, someone from the Vitiligo Society, someone from our Vitiligo community. There are so many of us out there who you can use for support. Another thing I feel that's really important is, again, as I've talked about, working on your mindset. So what could this look like for you? It might be therapy. It might be reaching out for a support coach. It might be um, looking at some form of healing. And what does that healing look like for you? Does it mean form of exercise? Does it mean, you know, some meditation? So really looking into keeping those stress levels at an all time minimum, because I think that's absolutely important. And the third thing I want to say is just really, really lighthearted, really lighthearted. Um, and that is. I honestly, honestly, I, I really feel strongly about this. I would say 20 years ago, people were staring and looking. There is so much emphasis based on what you look like, but who cares? If you've got vitiligo, this is what makes you you. And if this is, you know, how God's created you and how God wants you to look like, then you know what? Maybe this is the way. This is this is the way forward for you. However, on the flip side everyone's journey is individual to them and if there are other options out there that are suitable for you then that might be the, re the right step for you there is no right or wrong that's what I'm trying to say you've got to do what's right for you and everyone's journey is individual so just do what's right for you and sorry Natalie I forgot to answer the last question which is where can people find me they can find me under positively diverse um, on Instagram Facebook and LinkedIn 